Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about human rights and government policy. And welcome back to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I am your host, Michael Cloggs, and we have a new variant uh, of concern and that new variant it seems to be more transmittable and it seems to be running running around the, our globe um, unchecked we still have yet to, to know if um, the effectiveness of our vaccines against Omicron so the we have we have um, in in Canada uh, different um, provinces have been taking restrictions uh, in in hand and in some areas uh, such as British Columbia have closed nightclubs bars and health uh, centers um, or should I say uh, fitness centers and gyms and. There have been um, grants offered to those sort of businesses because, hey, the loss of income, somebody's got to be able to pay the, the bills, um, make payroll, rent, utilities, those sort of things have to still have to get paid even though the government has ordered them to be shut down. The um, federal government has expanded their... Uh, temporary uh, lockdown programs in order to help people uh, that have em- lost employment or lost time from their employer because of the lockdowns that have been imposed by different provinces over the Omicron variant. There has been an extended push for more vaccines and, and booster shots to help curb the effects of Omicron. The uh, WHO and the d- director, Dr. Tedros, has actually criticized some, some of the booster shot eff- efforts because he's saying that we need to have, in order to curb the number of variants that are coming up and the strength of the variants that we need to see more equity around the world with vaccines. It means that while industrialized countries such as Canada, United States, Britain, Germany um, have close to 90% vaccination rates, there are other countries in Africa and South America that such as such as the Congo, Zimbabwe, um, or um, Peru, or some other countries in South America, um, have barely been able to reach the forty percent of their population with vaccinations. There are also questions about. Uh, the MRA vaccines versus other uh, standard vaccinations. So we have a lot, a lot happening with human rights and different government policies and global policies over how we are going to protect people from the pandemic and transition the pandemic from global pandemic to endemic where there may only be pockets of people who have not found immunity to COVID-19. So with that the uh, back here in Canada um, of course Justin Trudeau's uh, three members of his staff have have tested positive. The Prime Minister himself has been exposed to COVID-19 and his last 
um, press conference was actually done virtually in order to protect the press and media and those around us around him um, from further exposure. He is promising that he he and his staff are taking ev every protocol possible in order to see their way through this new emergency. So the question the question is 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 vaccine equity going to be the key to ending the pandemic and moving things into an endemic situation? Does Canada need to, and Canada and other industrialized countries need to slow down their rate and pass on as many doses as possible to less industrialized countries and see what happens to the uh, the number of variants that start spreading around? Because at this point, they there may be a situation where the Omicron variant is going to overtake all the other variants and be the number one variant of concern and that they may have to reformulate the vaccines to adjust to the Omicron variant. So let's listen to um, segments from the WHO. We're going to listen to a couple segments from uh, British Columbia and a segment from um, the Canadian federal government. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. everyone. I'm, honored I'm honored to, to be, be here, here on, on the traditional, traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. For many British Columbians, the past several weeks have been enormously challenging. We have experienced some of the most damaging flooding in our province's history. Now, in partnership with all levels of government, we continue to make headway on our recovery. This is in large part due to the strength and resilience of British Columbians and their local leadership who are supporting each other and taking the challenges head on. Today, I'm joined by Minister of Health Adrian Dix and Dr. Bonnie Henry, the Provincial Health Officer, who will be speaking of yet another threat to our collective safety, the COVID-19 Omicron variant. The province has been monitoring the rapid spread of this variant, both here and at home and abroad, and the Provincial Health Officer will be announcing further restrictions today to help curb the spread. Our government continues to investigate supports for those who are or may be impacted by these new restrictions. And the Provincial COVID-19 Working Group met today to discuss this very thing. And as Deputy Premier and the Minister of Public Safety Solicitor General, I'll be working with Ministry staff to ensure that these new measures are properly enforced. Given the increases in cases we are experiencing, we need the public to do everything they can to slow the spread and to avoid any further burden on our health care systems. Compliance with these restrictions is key, and it's our collective responsibility. Earlier today, Emergency Management BC and the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure also issued a news release about upcoming severe winter weather. A series of strong storms will clash with cold Arctic air across BC through the holidays. Periods of heavy snow, freezing rain, and very cold weather are likely in many parts of BC between now and New Year's Day. We need to be ready to be prepared for extreme freezing temperatures and risks to our still vulnerable highways, especially highways 3, 5, and 99. I urge British Columbians to place close attention to weather forecasts and road closures. Focus on weather alerts for your area from Environment and Climate Change Canada. It is vital that we not only look after ourselves, but after each other as well. Dress for the weather. Ensure you and your loved ones have enough food and supplies. Check on vulnerable neighbours, and above all else, be safe. People experiencing homelessness are especially vulnerable in extreme temperatures. We're making sure the availability of warm, safe places to stay during the cold and wet weather. This winter, the province is providing more than 1,900 temporary shelter spaces and nearly 360 extreme weather shelter spaces. That's a 25% increase in the number of shelter spaces over last year. 
These emergency shelters supplement more than 2,250 permanent year-round shelter spaces currently open across the province. The extreme weather response shelters are available when a community issues an extreme weather alert. All communities have issued this alert ahead of the coming cold snap. For everyone, where an extreme weather alert is issued in your community, it is important to dress in layers with a wind and water resistant outer layer, cover as much exposed skin as possible by wearing hats, scarves and gloves, and to stay dry and change out of wet clothing as soon as possible. Again, British Columbians must be mindful of these added challenges in the coming days, and if possible, stay home and out of the weather. Lastly, I want to take this opportunity to thank the First Nations and local governments who have been vital in keeping our communities together through both the recent storms and the ongoing pandemic. The work crews who have made tremendous progress working day and night to repair our damaged highways, especially the Coquihalla. And the many health care providers who continue to fight COVID-19 day after day here in British Columbia and across the country. And with that, I'll now pass this update over to, uh, to Health Minister or over to, uh, to Dr. Henry. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Farnworth. Now over to you, Dr. Henry. Please go ahead. Thank you very much and good afternoon. And it is uh, my honour to be talking to you today from the traditional and unceded territories of the Lokungan speaking people, the Songhees and the Squamalt First Nations, and particularly on this day, the, the winter solstice, where we have our longest night of the year. It's a time to reflect, to reflect on what we've been through and to also think about where we're going, and that is moving towards the light, despite um, the challenges that we have had over this last few years and that we continue to have. It, uh, it, they say that adversity introduces us to ourselves, it's shown that we are strong, resilient, and supportive of each other. But our storm of, of COVID-19 is not yet over. We are in a different boat, but the consequences of not preparing for what is happening now all around us in our global community is just too great. Um, I know on Friday I had conversations. We spoke about the measures that we thought would be sufficient to get us through this. But I can tell you that over this weekend we have spent a lot of time understanding as much as we could about what is happening uh, with this variant how it's being transmitted in places around the world, and what is happening here in British Columbia. And today, I need to announce additional measures. What we're going to talk about today are new provincial health officer orders that will come into effect on December 22nd and will last until uh, the middle of January. In addition, we'll be talking about how our rapid testing program will supplement what we are doing here in British Columbia now, and we'll talk about our updated measures in our booster program. As you know, we have seen uh, things change in the last few days. There are still many things we do not yet know about Omicron and its impacts on the health care system and on people um, in British Columbia and around the world. I've spent quite a bit of time um, with colleagues, talking with uh, experts from around the world and watching what is happening globally. As I mentioned last Friday, we were putting together a puzzle and it still has a lot of spaces and holes, but some things are becoming very clear. One of those is that uh, Omicron is definitely spreading rapidly and is more transmissible than what we have seen with the Delta variants that we've been um, managing over the last few months. In addition, we're seeing it now rapidly replace uh, Delta as the predominant variant that we are seeing causing illness here in British Columbia, and particularly in the areas that have uh, uh, high populous areas that have had low rates in the past little while in Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health. There are some things that we don't yet know the details of, and one of those is severity of illness, the potential for significant impacts on our hospital system. And I don't need to say how fragile and how stretched our health care system is from the community, from long-term care, assisted living, um, into our acute care facilities at all levels. 
we know that people have been working very hard. Healthcare workers, whether they're doing case and contact management, testing, tracing, uh, whether we're working in the immunization clinics, in our hospitals, in our long-term care homes. As cases go up, we are stretched more and more. We need to take measures to make sure that we mitigate any impact on our health care system. And over this um, past weekend, it's become clear that our best case scenario about how uh, Omicron might be different in terms of severity are looking less and less likely. We have seen an increase in hospitalization in places like the UK that are ahead of us in terms of transmission of Omicron. And more recently and closer to home, we've seen this as well in Quebec, which is very concerning. We are seeing the replacement, um, as I mentioned, of Omicron from Delta. And we're also seeing what we call explosive outbreaks, which have to do with larger numbers of people being exposed at the same time, but also a, a shortening of the incubation period that we're seeing. So the transmission between generations is coming, is, is shorter. And we've seen that around the world as well um, in places like Copenhagen and uh, looking at specific outbreaks in the United States and here in Canada. Those are things that are worrisome to us because it can signal a dramatic impact in a short period of time on our hospital capacity. As well, we have seen increased evidence of immune escape. Basically, this virus is more easily, much more easily able to infect people who have been infected with previous um, variants of, of uh, COVID-19 and more easily able to infect people who have been vaccinated, although it's still a uh, magnitude uh, difference from people who are, have, don't have the protection that vaccine offers. So some of the information that, that uh, we have used to make the decisions about the measures that will be in place today are looking at what we're seeing uh, here in British Columbia. And really it is about buying us time to understand and to prepare the consequences of not slowing things down, of not taking these actions, are just too dire. We need to protect our health care system for everybody who needs care. So what we have seen as of today, that we've uh, uh, even compared to last week, we've seen a rapid takeoff in cases, particularly in Vancouver Coastal, where cases have been low for some time, and also in Fraser Health. We've seen the leveling off in the interior and a rapid increase in island health, which has had low cases along the way. Um, we've continued to see decreases in northern health, but again, we need to be prepared for this to level off as well. We are at the point where we've seen hospitalizations decrease, and particularly um, we are still not seeing yet hospitalizations increase dramatically for those people who are unvaccinated or, thankfully, in vaccinated cases. This gives us some suggestion that, um, of the protection that vaccination gives. Having said that, we know this is a lagging indicator and we've started to see in other jurisdictions that this can also take off quite rapidly. This also reminds us, this slide reminds us that uh, the, the risk is uh, fundamentally different if you don't have any protection through the, the immunization um, that vaccines give us. And we've started to see an increase in both vaccinated and unvaccinated cases. As well, I look at the age groups of where we're seeing transmission and no surprise where this transmission is really taking off is in younger people who are more highly connected. They go to work, they have children, there are uh, connections in communities, social connections as well. So 19 to 39 in the 40 to 59 year age group. And of course, as we break that down again between those who have protection from vaccination and those who don't yet, um, the, the difference is also very stark. So what does this tell us? This tells us that Omicron is making a difference in our trajectory of our pandemic now in British Columbia and that we need to take additional actions so that we can manage this and get through yet another wave. 
So uh, this is uh, the data from um, our laboratory showing how Omicron is really taking over from Delta and replacing all of the other strains starting in Vancouver Coastal and not far behind Fraser Health and uh, Island Health as well. And all of this affects our, um, the modeling that is now dramatically changed from even what we showed just last week. Our reproductive number is now above one in all regions, although in northern health it still is uh, slightly below one, but trending upwards again. Where we see the most dramatic difference is in Vancouver coastal health, where now every case transmits to at least two others. And that leads to, to propagated more um, rapidly moving outbreaks. This tells us that the exposure and, and you know, we are learning about this virus after two years, almost two years. And we know that it is inevitable now that most of us in the province will be exposed at some point. The way this virus is being transmitted, this strain of the virus is being transmitted in communities across the province, it is over time very likely that all of us will have exposure to it. How it affects us depends on our own actions and what we are doing. And we talked last week about the importance of reducing our social gatherings. And uh, the focus on Friday was how to have safer social gatherings. We are now transitioning to reducing those social gatherings to as low as possible for this period of time to try and reduce that risk of exposure until we can flatten and slow down the curve. Um, the orders that we put in place around personal gatherings will remain with the really important caveat that the principle needs to be to keep those numbers as small as possible. Minister Farnworth talks about all of the things that we have been through here in BC over the last few months. And I know at this time of the year we need to be with our family. We need to be with our friends, our close friends, to support them, to provide support, to get the support, both emotional and physical support that we need. So we are telling people there are things that you need to do right now. You need to keep your groups as small as possible, and it ne needs to be the same group of people. So not um, one family here tonight and another tomorrow and lunch with friends the next day. We need to keep our groups small. We know how to do that. We know how to connect with others in different ways. So pick your group, make it as small as possible, and stick with them this holiday season. Find other ways to safely connect with other people in your life, virtually or outside or at a distance. Second, understand your own risk and the people you live with, people in your family. If somebody has a serious illness that puts them at risk, then cut back on your social activities even more. We have to protect ourselves with these risks. Third, if you are attending the event, know how many people will be there and stick with your own small group. Keep those groups small. Most of these events should not be happening, but if you need to get together, keep it as small as absolutely possible. Understand the setting you're going to. Is it a large venue with lots of space so that you can more safely gather? Is there ventilation? Is there things you can do to improve the ventilation? And can you meet outdoors instead of indoors? Ensure you have all of the layers of protection in place. Given that uh, people the space to stay safe, wearing your masks when you're in indoor settings, especially giving that uh, respectful distance to people, stay behind barriers, wash your hands, increase ventilation. These are all things that we can do right now. We know that this is a, a a disappointing and discouraging thing to hear at this point in time. People in BC have stepped up. We've done the right thing over and over. We've gotten vaccinated in record numbers. We've supported each other to get booster doses, to have small gatherings, to do the right thing. But the, the challenge that we have is this virus doesn't recognize that. What it does, it has changed and so must we. But I know that we can continue to support each other to do this together. So our new public health orders 
um, will include a, a ban on indoor organized gatherings of any size. So that is weddings, reception, wedding receptions, um, celebratory events, parties, Christmas parties, New Year's parties, whether they're at banquet halls, at event spaces, whether they're an event in a restaurant or in a private setting. We need to stop those for this period of time. We will be closing bars and nightclubs for this short period of time. We know that those are settings where people socialize, where um, that uh, right now, those are risky settings, especially for the demographic that we're talking about where we're seeing widespread transmission. So this does not include um, pubs and cafes and restaurants. This is the specific liquor licenses and will be detailed in, our, in the order, um, but it is specific to bars and nightclubs. Gyms, fitness centers and dance studios will also be closed uh, for this period of time. We know as well that these, unfortunately, have been um, places where transmission events have happened and have spread out to people in the community. So we need to go to, uh, to um, the very important remote support for people in some of these. I know my gym does that, uh, the yoga studios, etc., for this period of time. Restaurants will continue to be able to operate um, with the meal service that we know is important. We know that these seated um, events or are, are seated uh, um, settings are much less risk, but we're going to go back to what um, worked for us during the last waves of this pandemic, and so that is smaller groups maximum of six people per table, wearing masks. We already put in last week um, the importance of not having congregation and people coming together, having additional space or barriers within restaurants and not moving between, uh, between tables. And finally, we'll also be adding, uh, we had uh, last week put in uh, uh, capacity limits for the larger venues, of sports events and theatres and concerts. Now um, seated events will be reduced to 50% capacity regardless of the venue size. So, so that includes movie theatres, theatres, um, arenas, etc. And again, the really important measures that we know help, uh, which is using the BC vaccine card, checking the QR code, enforcing of mask wearing, and that additional extra space to give uh, uh, room for people and to ensure that there's enough ventilation support around people. So these will come into effect on December 22nd at midnight and will be in effect until January 18th. And that is very specific. There are a number of things that are happening over this period of time, um, including we need to support the return safe to schools, the K-12 to schools on January 4th, and we're working very closely with our ministry and, and stakeholder table to support that. And on January 10th is the re, uh, return to on-campus learning at uh, post-secondary institutions. In addition, this gives us a period of time for us to continue to monitor, to fill in those pieces of the puzzle and to better understand the impact that Omicron is going to have on our context in BC, on our health care system, and making sure that those resources are there for all of us. So this is a summary and overview of the public health orders that have been in place and will continue until at least the middle of January. Supplementing part of this is how do we uh, use the rapid antigen tests and the various different forms that we have here in BC to support us getting through this period of time. I want to really emphasize rapid antigen testing, the point of care testings that we have, these are red lights, not green lights. So having a negative test does not mean that you don't have to pay attention to the gathering limits, to the different um, measures that we have in place, our layers of protection in the facility, in the places that you are going. So it doesn't mean you can have a larger gathering. It doesn't mean you don't need to wear your mask. The important thing about point of care tests and the PCR testing is that if they're positive, it tells you that you cannot do those things. It is a red light not a green light. And it is important that these are used for people who have symptoms to help understand what is causing their symptoms, where that will make a difference. 
just uh, and right now we have a lot of people who are, are lining up for some of our tests that are want to just have an understanding of, the, of whether they have COVID right now and that is not where these rapid tests are helpful and it is leading to long lines in our, our PCR testing which we absolutely need to support us being able to understand people who have um, COVID-19. So to date, we've received a little over 3 million uh, point of care tests of a variety of different types of these tests and distributed about 1.26 million across uh, the province in, in five key areas. We are using quite a few in long-term care and acute care to support staff working in those facilities. Uh, we have a very successful program that has helped us in pro provincial corrections from the very beginning um, where people are moving in and out of that facility in a rapid basis. We've also been uh, re using these really uh, a lot in, in our remote First Nations communities in particular to be able to identify if COVID has in a community very quickly, particularly um, in communities where access to PCR is, uh, is challenging. We also have been using them uh, for case and contact management, for identifying clusters, for supporting schools for, uh, where there's been exposure events and outbreaks, supporting um, post-secondary institutions, supporting workplaces, um, including uh, we have a lot of testing going on in some of the larger uh, industrial camps where we have group accommodations, where we have accommodations for temporary farm workers. And those uh, business and organizations have been supported in having a variety of testing strategies where we've been involved with them. In the coming weeks and months, we expect to have additional supply of rapid tests. We're expecting a delivery from Canada of 200,000 PanBio rapid tests. These are the ones with a nasal swab that can be um, broken down and used for individual tests. We've also purchased 500,000 of the BTNX tests that we had not yet received uh, with nasal swabs and the expected delivery of those is, is by the end of December. And Canada has told us that we should expect 84 million of five different types of, of rapid tests um, in the country for all provinces and territories um, sometime at the end, uh, near the end of January. Of these, about 10 million are expected to be the at-home uh, lateral flow tests, the ones that we have been uh, planning to receive for some time. Um, and we have requested our share, which is about 13.5% of these. So that leaves us uh, about 11 million uh, different types of tests that we expect will arrive sometime in the middle to end of January. Beyond that, it is still unclear what uh, the ongoing supply will be um, it, going forward. So our planning right now between mid-December, between now and between when the uh, ongoing supply comes in or when the, the additional supply comes in in mid-January, we're currently using about 35,000 tests per week and we have an inventory of about 2.6 million of different types of tests. We are going to be expanding our use to support the collection or the testing of people at, at our testing sites, at health sites, um, people with symptoms. And that's where the majority of these will be going and uh, are going already um, to support rapid testing of people with symptoms who are at low risk of having severe illness. And so we can provide advice on how to self-manage their illness. Uh, we will be also uh, deploying them over the next few weeks in higher numbers to long-term care, to all long-term care facilities, to assist in use of staff and testing of visitors along with the, uh, the ongoing screening that's happening right now. One of the key considerations that I have and we have is to continue to protect the seniors and elders in long-term care. Part of our, our rationale for the vaccine mandate that we have in place is how important that is to build those walls to make sure that people who are coming in are not infected and we're going to be adding uh, this additional testing uh, for visitors into long-term care in the coming weeks. 
We also will continue to use them to support health care workers in acute care in facilities around the province. Right now, there is uh, rapid access to PCR tests in many of our acute care facilities, particularly our COVID hospitals. But as this new strain is spreading rapidly in the community, there will be health care workers who will be exposed. And we, may, we will be supplementing the PCR program with rapid tests to support be staying at work. Um, test to stay programs and uh, investigation of clusters and exposure events. We are also um, deploying additional uh, 1.2 million of the tests approximately, and this has started already um, to remote and rural communities to help detect when uh, Omicron is in our COVID is in those communities and in First Nations communities, and are looking at how we can deploy them as well to support vulnerable populations. And part of this is about having a strategy in place for rapid testing. And access to treatment, if, uh, as we know, um, that some of the antiviral treatments, Paxlovid in particular, are are under review by Health Canada. Canada, um, Canada has purchased millions of doses of these, and we need to have a plan in place to be able to provide rapid access to those who will benefit from um, antiviral treatment um, because it needs to be given within a short period of time. So that's a strategy that we will be making sure we have um, in place by the time those are approved for use. Currently as well, we have a strategy through our testing centres to make sure we can get rapid access to uh, citrovimab and some of the other uh, monoclonal antibodies that are still effective against this strain. We will continue to expand our point of care screening program in businesses and organizations as we know that this can, uh, especially as we mentioned, some of the group accommodations in, to help manage and prevent outbreaks and uh, use by um, regional medical health officers and our health authorities to again support and manage outbreaks in communities. Once we uh, receive some of the additional uh, testing that we're expecting in mid-January and beyond, we're going to be uh, expanding access to publicly funded tests at additional locations in the community. Um, this is to help look at how we can manage community spread and protect people who are clinically extreme, extremely vulnerable in these communities. A large part of what we're doing in our strategy will be to support K-12 students and staff return to school and continuity of in-person learning. And this is where we can support families to be able to have testing after exposures so that children can remain in school. Uh, as well, we'll be using uh, them to support return to campus for post-secondary education for students, faculty and staff in residences and expanding the programs that we have had in those areas. And finally, uh, expansion and replenishment for the work that we're doing with rapid tests in, in long-term care and acute care and in our health care facilities across the province. We will, of course, continue to monitor the effectiveness and the utility and how we are using these and making sure that we can support their effective use um, for people um, um, who have symptoms and need to understand their uh, need to, to um, isolate and manage um, over the coming months. So we are in a very uncertain time. We will be learning more about what Omicron means for us, the context that it's in. We're reserving our, our we're deploying our rapid tests to supplement the testing so that we can understand how it's moving through our communities and so we can ensure that we have the health care resources um, to, to keep our health care system functioning. And there's much that we will learn in the next few weeks. Part of this as well will be the importance of ramping up our boost program as we've talked about. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Good morning. I'm honored to be here on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. On Tuesday, 
Minister Dix, Dr. Henry, and I announced new restrictions to help flatten the curve given the sharp rise that we are seeing in COVID-19 cases. The Omicron variant has proven to be much more transmissible both here and around the globe. Our healthcare workers are working overtime to keep people safe and respond to the surge in cases. But we need British Columbians to redouble our efforts to slow the spread and to avoid any further burden on our hospitals. We need to support our healthcare workers and help ensure that healthcare services continue to be there for people when they show up at hospitals needing care. Also on Tuesday, I spoke of the efforts of the Provincial Minister and COVID-19 Working Group to investigate <coughs> supports for those who are affected by the new restrictions. And I want to report that due to the efforts this week of the Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and, Inno and Innovation, Minister Callan, who is joining me today, will run through the details of those new supports. Funding relief is coming for those businesses ordered closed. These closures are not something that anyone wants before the holidays, but the reality is we are faced with, with having the, to make these restrictions to protect each other and our hospitals. I also want to take this opportunity to reiterate a warning about the severe winter weather we are expecting through to the new year. In the coming days, periods of heavy and blowing snow, freezing rain, and very cold weather are likely in most parts of BC. In some areas, that weather has already arrived. We've been working this week to ensure both provincial road crews and First Nations and local governments are prepared for what is to come. Along with coordination calls and officer support, Emergency Management BC's regional offices have been distributing Environment Canada, Canada notifications to local government staff to help to, to prepare overall preparedness. And this winter, the province is providing more than 1,900 temporary shelter spaces and nearly 360 extreme weather shelter spaces to keep people experiencing homelessness safe. That's a 25% increase in the numbers of shelters over last year. These emergency shelters supplement more than 2,250 permanent year-round shelter spaces currently open across BC. Outreach workers in various communities across our province are providing people who are homeless with information about the shelters and the potential weather emergency and the response shelters that are available in their communities. The police will also connect people who are homeless with shelter supports and services where needed. We've seen this kind of outreach over the past several months in Prince George, for example where service providers have been attending a homeless encampment in Prince George almost daily to inform residents of their options for shelter and to provide them with information. When a person expresses interest, the outreach workers help facilitate the moving of their belongings and the person themselves to an available shelter. This gives people who are living or sleeping on the street or in public places a warm place to sleep with foods and other supports in extremely wet or cold weather. This government and your First Nation or local government are all doing our part given the forecast conditions. However, it is vital that all of us step up to prepare, to do what is necessary to protect themselves, their families and vulnerable friends or neighbours. I urge everyone to weather forecasts and road closures. Focus on weather alerts for your area from Environment Canada. Make sure that you put together an emergency kit in case of power outages. Follow directions of your local government to find the nearest emergency warming shelter. Bring food, water and warm clothes or blankets when traveling by car. And above all else, be safe. Lastly, on behalf of government, I want to wish happy holidays to everyone celebrating in BC. I know this is not the Christmas that we are hoping for, but I also know how resilient we are in this province. Our government is going to continue to be there for people and businesses, and I know British Columbians will continue to be there for each other. I hope that everyone can have a happy, safe and healthy way to celebrate through the new year as we look to better days ahead. With that, I will pass this update over to Minister Kalon to provide details on the business supports. Thank you. Good morning. 
I'm uh, Ravi Kalan, BC's Minister for Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, in particular the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Earlier this week, Dr. Henry announced temporary orders to help us address the sudden surge of COVID-19 case counts here in British Columbia. I think it's fair to say that we're all exhausted by COVID-19, but unfortunately, COVID-19 is not done with us. People, businesses, and our communities have been through a lot this year, and I recognize how difficult yet necessary these health orders are for our health and safety and how challenging these are for businesses, for owners, for workers, the families, customers, especially at this time of year. Businesses across uh, the province have been working hard to do everything they can to keep people safe. They have been resilient time and time again. I know for those operating gyms, uh, fitness centers, uh, bars, nightclubs, and banquet halls, this is gonna be a very challenging time of the year. As we have done since the beginning of this pandemic, our government is, will always be there to support those hardest hit. And I want to share that help is on the way. Today, I'm pleased to announce that the government of British Columbia is establishing the COVID-19 Closure Relief Grant. This new grant will be available for businesses that have been ordered closed by the recent public health order. Relief grants will be between $1,000 and $10,000 in one-time funding that will be provided to eligible businesses based on their number of employees, following the similar formula that we used for the previous Circuit Breaker Relief Grant Program, which supported businesses in spring 2021. This grant can be used to help with expenses like employee wages, like paying rent, insurance, and maintenance and utilities. I wanted to share this news with you today so that businesses know that financial support is on its way and that we're committed to helping them through these very difficult times. I want to thank my team at the Ministry of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation for fast-tracking this program. We estimate it will fully expense, this program will cost roughly $10 million and will be ready to accept applications in January. Eligible businesses that are already in the government system through existing COVID-19 relief programs, such as the Small and Medium-Sized Recovery Grant Program or the Circuit Breaker Business Relief Grant, will have their applications streamlined. Since the outside of the pandemic, our government has said that we will be there for businesses and people. That is what this grant is all about, helping these businesses in time of need. And I want to uh, and, and it complements the supports announced by the federal government yesterday. We've seen and felt the toll of this pandemic, and we know how much of it has been felt by some of our businesses. We understand that the news around the orders and the timing is incre inc incredibly challenging. At a time, at the same time, we must quickly respond to what we need to do to best protect British Columbians. We cannot leave Omicron unchecked. We will continue to listen and learn and respond to the evolving situation. This grant is one way to directly help through this difficult time. I want to encourage everyone in British Columbia to continue to support these businesses by buying gift cards and memberships for future use. These businesses are an important part of our local community and provide jobs to thousands of British Columbians. We need them and they need us. So please give them your support. And with that, happy to take any questions. As a reminder to media on the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Please also remember to take your phone off mute. You will not be audible until your name is called. Our first question today is from Binder Sajan, CTV. Please go ahead. Um, hi there. Sorry, I'm just reading through the circuit breaker um, eligibility right here. Um, it looks like the circuit breaker before was twenty thousand uh, up to twenty thousand dollars, and this is ten thousand um, dollars. I just want to hope you can comment about that. But also, just you know, I know you're not the public health, but wondering um, why these specific businesses were targeted. Um, some people are saying. You know, they've taken all the precautions necessary, haven't seen any spread in their locations, and just wondering why, you know, 
specifically fitness um, facilities were shut down. Yeah, uh, first, uh, your first question, Binder, uh, on um, uh, the previous circuit uh, breaker grant was uh, two months, and that's why it was up to 20000 the one month period. So this uh, closure relief grant that we're uh, launching today uh, can provide businesses up to uh, between $1,000 and $10,000, uh, depending on how many employees they have. Um, you know, as for the, the measures announced by Dr. Henry, uh, I don't think uh, Dr. Henry or anyone at PHO or Minister Dix wants to shut any businesses down. Um, this is something that is uh, necessary. Uh, they've deemed necessary to protect both people, but also protect our health care system uh, and uh, you know we're seeing just record number of cases already in British Columbia and we're seeing it across the, the province and other jurisdictions have made similar um, decisions to protect their system and I'll just say that uh, I've spent my life in in, uh, in gyms uh, and so I know the value of um, uh, the gym for fitness for mental health uh, and uh, and so I know it plays an important role in our communities uh, and, but just like myself and others uh, we're gonna have to find out other ways to uh, ensure that we get our supports for mental health, that we're getting our exercise, that we're going out with our families for walks through these challenging times, because it's going to be critically important. Uh, we know it's a hard time for, for these uh, businesses in particular, um, but, uh, you know, the, today's um, is part of the steps that we're taking to support them through this challenging time. Binder, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, uh, and just, you know, it would be great to get the news release a couple of minutes earlier just so we could uh, formulate our questions. I'm looking through it now, and it says that the uh, grant program will open in January. So how soon can businesses expect to actually receive the money? And just with regards to previous programs like this, were they fully utilized? Uh, well, the previous um, uh, funds between the small and medium-sized business grant and the circuit breaker grant program, we actually um, uh, supported businesses with $526 million last year, uh, which is quite considerable considering our initial budget was $300 million. But we made sure that we made it clear to businesses that if the need was there, we would provide the support. Uh, we uh, will be launching the program in early January. Businesses that have already come through the system, for example, just gyms alone, about 1,100 of them have already accessed uh, either the small and medium-sized grant program or the circuit breaker program. Uh, they will be streamlined uh, because we've got a lot of their information, so they'll be able to get money much quicker uh, than any previous program that we've had. Uh, the process for the circuit breaker, and the, which will be similar, is very simple, uh, and most businesses told us that it took less than five minutes for them to apply, and we're going to keep the same criteria uh, for this program. Our next question is from Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, will this program automatically be available to other businesses if they are shut down before this wave of the pandemic ends? Uh, well, I don't want to get into hypotheticals, and, and certainly my hope is that uh, we don't have to see that. Um, but we have structured the program in a way that it can be expanded uh, if it needs to be. Um, and so that's one of the benefits of kind of uh, building a system that we have actually already tested. Um, and it helps us both to streamline those that have already been in the system. But of course, if we need to adapt, uh, it certainly will be nimble enough to adapt as we go forward. Lisa, did you have a follow-up? Yes. On the nimbleness of your program, um, are employers or are these businesses allowed to decide themselves whether they want to use the grant to pay rent or to subsidize employees or to pay for utilities? We know that uh, n not all businesses are the same. Uh, each business has unique challenges. And so we have uh, purposely built the grant, the non-repayable grant, in a way that the, the business can decide what's the best use. We know in the past businesses have used these dollars to uh, provide support for their uh, employees, and some have used them for rents. So we wanted to make sure that it was broad enough that the business can decide what their immediate need is and use that for their immediate need. Our next question is from Mira Baines, CBC. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, this question is for Minister Callan. Uh, what's your response to people suggesting there's no consistency about what stays open and what gets shut down? For example, why are casinos allowed to stay open on New Year's Eve? 
Yeah, uh, again, these are questions I think are uh, better posed to provincial health uh, uh, as they make decisions around, um, you know, the the needs to close businesses down. Uh, I will say that uh, I know from talking to Dr. Henry and Minister Dix and others, nobody wants to close anything down. Uh, but when we see record number of cases, when we see Omicron taking off in jurisdictions all around the world, we need to do what we need to do to protect people, but also our, our health care system. And so decisions are made uh, on um, what we've seen, where we've seen cases come up in the past. Uh, we've seen other jurisdictions follow similar routes. And uh, and so uh, I, I would say that uh, questions directed to why one venue to another is probably better for PHO and, and Dr. Henry. Mira, did you have a follow-up? Yes. Um, and it's another one for Mr. C uh, Minister Callan. Um, Businesses we've talked to say they need relief funding now, and they say that waiting until January might be too long for them. Why can't the funding get to businesses in 2021? Uh, well, we're uh, just announced the program today, obviously, within 48 hours of, um, of measures being announced by Provincial Health Office. Uh, you know, programs like this take people to uh, administer. We had program staff, around 80 staff, that we pulled in from other ministries uh, to run our programs, and, and many of the staff have moved to their ministries again, and we'll be working to bring many of them back, get the websites up, and so on. But we will be streamlining the application process for every information uh, and uh, we expect that businesses will get their money quite fast because they've already been in the system. Our next question is from Mike Hager, Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Um, I'm just curious as to whether Omicron is affecting uh, your staffing levels in the provincial government. Are, are uh, programs being impacted by the level of uh, people calling in sick? Um, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, certainly, we haven't seen many impacts with my ministry. I can't speak for uh, on behalf of government. Minister Farnworth might want to take that question. Uh, do you want to take okay, I'll give it to Minister Farnworth. No, uh, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that question, uh, Mike. I think the the challenge that we are seeing is is that it's not just uh, Omicron, uh, but over the uh, the past year, it has been Omicron, it has been fires, it has been floods, it has been heat dome, it has been a whole range of emergencies that the province has been facing, uh, and uh, it puts a lot of uh, challenges and a lot of stress uh, on uh, a very hardworking public service in this province, um, and and first responders and communities as well. Uh, so all of the those things together have created significant challenges, but I have to say that uh, uh, people have stepped up and are doing a remarkable job. Mike, did you have a follow-up? Always. Uh, so there's no data there on staffing and, and how many people are are off and whether those numbers are increasing uh, by a large margin this holidays. But I'll, I'll pivot. My follow-up is, um, you know, you've announced this help for business owners. What about workers? Um, anything coming on the rent subsidy and the moratorium on evictions? Yeah, thanks for that question. And uh, I'll just highlight that um, uh, the moment we were notified on Tuesday uh, around the provincial health orders, uh, I had an opportunity to speak with Minister Carlo, Carlo Quattro from the federal government, and we made sure that our programs were fully aligned with them. That's something that we've been trying from the beginning of the pandemic to make sure that our programs are complementary. Uh, we know that the federal government came in with supports for businesses that were partially closed. That's why we are announcing the closure relief grant today for businesses that have been um, closed because of um, health orders, uh, because the federal programs uh, didn't support that. The, obviously, there's uh, supports uh, announced by the federal government to uh, provide supports for workers that have been impacted either full-time or at least even workers that have been impacted half-time. And, uh, and also additional supports for uh, businesses that uh, are uh, partially open and not, not fully closed. So we came in with the supports to support businesses uh, where there was gaps within the, the federal um, uh, announcement, uh, which was made yesterday. Our next question is from Caden Fanshaw, CKPG. Please go ahead. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. I just want to jump on that again. So just to be clear, the province is 
that you can't do anything to support workers at this time or the holidays. Well, the, the announcement by the federal government yesterday has supports for uh, workers. Um, uh, they've announced uh, some more flexibility so that more workers can get access to it. There's also the announcement of the wage subsidy actually can keep workers on um, that are uh, partially closed. So there are supports in place. Of course, uh, the, the pandemic is evolving and, uh, and the supports continue to evolve as we go forward. But as of now, we made sure that our supports are as complementary to the federal government supports as we could have. Caden, did you have a follow-up? I do, yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to go back to Northern Health here. We've been under restriction since November the 18th. Uh, regional orders, uh, businesses are barely hanging on by a limb here. Um, but it took the whole province to get shut down to have any support for these businesses in Northern BC. And I talked to Northern Health yesterday. There's no clear sign that when these provincial ones are over, our regional orders will be over either. Um, why did it take so long to get support to Northern businesses? And will this support be extended as long as the Northern orders are as well? Well, uh, the the restrictions on Northern Health were uh, in particular just for restaurants uh, and limiting them serving alcohol past 10 o'clock. Uh, restaurants continue to operate at, capa at full capacity uh, and they could serve alcohol up to 10 o'clock. So that was the only restriction in the interior, uh, sorry, in the north. It was the same restriction that was in parts of the Fraser Valley for a short period. And of course, uh, these uh, funding announcement that we made today is for businesses that have been uh, forced to be closed uh, due to health measures. And so um, uh, these supports are the same for anyone, regardless there, if they're in Northern Health, if they're in Interior, for their Lower Mainland or the Vancouver Island. That's all the questions we have for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Hey, I'm Russ Rafino, and if you're a coach, consultant, expert, author, or speaker, I have just one question for you. Do you know where your next client is coming from? See, if you're like most coaches out there, the truth is that you've been lied to. The other gurus out there with their fake jets and their fake cars and their fake houses and all the rest of it have told you that if you want to attract new clients in your business, then you have to be crazy active on social media, right? I mean, they want you to create 50 pieces of content a day, post to Instagram, post to Facebook, post to YouTube, post your stories, take pictures, make videos, spend like $20,000 on a website, right? Fly blog posts a day and on and on and on. But there's just one problem. Nobody really wants to do any of that shit. <laughs> but what if I told you that I've built a $50 million coaching company without that stuff? Now look, don't take my word for it. Here's the proof. This is the inside of our Stripe account. Now that's my payment processor. And right there you can see that in just the past few years, my company has done over $50 million in revenue. But you know what? That's not the cool part. The cool part, especially for you, is that I did this without millions of followers, without a New York Times bestseller, without spending all day on social media, without grinding out all these like posts and things, but most importantly of all, without pretending to be somebody I'm not. So look, I'm a professional coach, just like you. The only difference is that I've cracked the code on the secret to enrolling new clients like clockwork every day, even at $5,000 to $15,000 prices. Now, not only that, but I've been able to teach the same strategy to over 3,500 coaches, consultants, experts, doctors, and speakers just like you. And they've used this strategy to collectively do probably over half a billion dollars in high ticket coaching sales over the years. So I've just put together a free online training where I will pull back the curtain and I'll walk you through this exact strategy that I use to build my eight figure coaching business without doing any of that marketing stuff that nobody wants to do and you don't want to do. In fact, the whole strategy has just four steps. That's it. So here's what I want you to do. Click the link under this video. 
you're gonna be taken to a sign up page that looks like this, where you can sign up and you can get a 24 hour pass to watch this training. So sign up, watch the whole thing start to finish, and then be ready to take notes because this is the same presentation that my client Brian saw. Now Brian put these strategies into practice and they were so powerful that within the next 10 weeks, he was able to close over $300,000 in revenue of his new program. And not only that, but within five months after that, he was able to do over a million dollars in revenue collected. And guess what? Here's the cool part. Brian is a handstand coach, right? A handstand coach. I mean, so how many handstand coaches do you know that are clearing over seven figures a year? I can guarantee you there's not that many. And that's what's so cool about the strategy. It doesn't matter what kind of coaching you do. You could be a relationship coach, a health coach, a dating coach, a doctor, therapist, financial advisor, it doesn't matter. As long as you create huge breakthroughs for your clients in life or in business, then you can use this exact same strategy to attract new clients into your business every single day. You don't need a big audience, you don't need a massive following, you don't need to spend all day on social media. In fact, this works even if nobody's ever heard of you. In fact, I'm gonna show you a strategy that is so powerful that it literally takes somebody from clicking on an ad, just like this one, to signing up with you as a new client for $3,000 to $15,000 or more within just 24 to 48 hours. And again, even if they've never heard of you. So click a link under this video. That's gonna take you to a page that looks like this. Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. We're joined virtually by Ministers Freeland, Qualtro, Duclo, as well as Dr. Tam and Dr. New. We're here today to talk about what we're doing to support workers and businesses and keep people safe. Before I get started, I just spoke with the two new leaders of Chile and Germany, both progressive leaders, where we talked about ch climate change, growing the middle class, trade and youth, protecting democracy, and of course, how we're all going to work together to get through this COVID pandemic. À quelques jours de Noël, je sais que beaucoup sont inquiets. Comme depuis le début de la pandémie, on sera là pour vous. Aujourd'hui, on adapte nos mesures de soutien pour s'assurer que personne Soit laissé pour compte. We made a promise at the beginning of the pandemic to have everyone's backs, as long as it took, as much as it took. That was the right thing, not just to help minimize the impact of the health crisis, but also to ensure that our economy uh, could handle the shocks that this crisis was facing. And that's unfortunately uh, what we're going to be continuing to do right now. I say unfortunately because, of course, Nobody wants to be in the middle of an Omicron wave right now, but we are. So we are announcing today that we're temporary, temporarily expanding eligibility for key programs. For the Canada Worker Lockdown Benefit and the Local Lockdown Program, you'll be able to apply if you're subject to capacity limiting restrictions. The Deputy Prime Minister will have the details, but here's the bottom line. We need to, all of us, do what it takes to so Canadians are protected and to have what you need to weather the storm. We're going to be there for the hard hit regions, for specific sectors like art and culture, hospitality and tourism. We will be there to keep you and your family safe. We're going to continue to work closely with the provinces and territories, but we will be there with supports for the areas that need it. Notre priorité c'est que les hôpitaux ne débordent pas. Avec plus de 80% des gens pleinement vaccinés, euh, vous avez fait la bonne chose et vos efforts aident. Ceux qui ne sont pas encore vaccinés, allez-y. Et par rapport aux boosters, sachez, on a assez de doses de rappel pour tous les Canadiens qui sont admissibles. Alors, allez-y dès que c'est votre tour. Euh, on sait que euh, ces doses de rappel vont aider. Get your booster shots. We have enough in the country uh, for everyone who needs it. Uh, so please go get those booster shots. They give you extra protection against Omicron uh, and in keeping us all safe. 
Uh, pediatric vaccines continue to roll out, get our kids vaccinated as well. Uh, it's going to be really, really important that we do everything we can uh, to get through this. We know that rapid tests are a part of the solution as well. We've delivered uh, about 85 million rapid tests up until the month of December to provinces and territories. Just this month in December, we're delivering about 35 million rapid tests to provinces and territories. And we've got tens and tens of millions uh, more rapid tests arriving in the coming weeks uh, into the new year. Uh, so provinces and territories uh, will have the supplies necessary to get them into people's hands. We need to follow public health guidelines to keep loved ones safe and to support our healthcare workers. I know people are tired. People don't want to be in this Omicron situation. I get it. None of us want to be here. We're tired of COVID. We want it to just go away, but we know it's not going to just go away unless we all do our part. Particularly when you think of how tired you are, how weary you are of having to deal with this COVID crisis that continues to go on and on and on, Know that there are people more tired than you. Know that our healthcare workers haven't had much of a break over the past two years, that they've been going flat out, keeping people safe, working in long-term care homes, working uh, in hospitals and clinics, administering vaccines and boosters. Our frontline health workers have been extraordinary heroes. They have been there for us every step of the way. And now we need to be there for them. We need to prevent Omicron from overwhelming our healthcare systems. In order to do that, we have to keep contacts low. We have to make choices that are going to keep us and our family safe because Omicron is out there. And the way we show our support for those people who've been keeping us safe is by making sure they don't get overloaded this winter. We know this variant is spreading very quickly around the world, around the country, and indeed uh, around our own uh, communities and offices. My office is not immune. Uh, we have uh, three members of my staff and three members of my security detail who've tested positive. They're following all public health guidance. So am I, uh, and so must we all. But it's a reminder that the virus is all around us. It's very much a threat. We have to keep our guard up. À Noël, je sais qu'il y a des gens qui vont pas pouvoir se rassembler comme ils l'auraient voulu. Pour ma part, j'ai hâte de passer du temps de qualité avec ma famille proche, uh, mais il y aura pas de, de, de party ou de rassemblement. Uh, C'est la réalité à laquelle nous faisons tous face. The thing is, though, we know what works. Canadians have shown over the past two years that we're able to step up for each other, that we are there for each other. We know what to do. We know how to wear masks. We know how to keep our distances. We know how to reduce our contact numbers. And if we do that well over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see a better winter and especially a better spring than otherwise. I know nobody wants to be in this situation right now, but Canadians have shown that we're there for our neighbors. We're there for our most vulnerable. We're there uh, for our frontline health workers. We have vaccines. We have PPE. We have rapid tests. We know what to do. We're going to do it because that's who we are as Canadians. We stick up for each other. We make those tough choices to keep each other safe. And we know that as long and dark as winters can be, spring is coming and spring will be better if we hunker down in the coming weeks. Merci beaucoup, mes chers amis. Je passe maintenant la parole à la uh, vice-première ministre Freeland. Christia, go ahead. OK. Merci, monsieur le premier ministre. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, dans les derniers jours, nous avons constaté une montée des cas de COVID-19. Certaines régions du pays signalent des nombres de cas records. Le variant Omicron du virus est beaucoup plus facilement transmissible que les autres. Et nous ne pouvons pas 
nous montrer complaisantes. Depuis le début de la pandémie, nous nous efforçons d'être souples et de nous adapter à la nature changeante de la pandémie. À l'intérieur de nos programmes, nous nous assurons de prévoir la marge du manœuvre nécessaire afin de réagir rapidement et efficacement. La semaine dernière, nous avons fait adopter le projet de loi C2. Cette loi a permis la mise en place de mesures ciblées pour soutenir les travailleurs et les entreprises si des confinements étaient nécessaires pour contenir la propagation du virus. Au mois d'octobre, lorsque nous avons présenté ces mesures plus ciblées, nous ne connaissons pas encore le variant Omicron, mais nous nous sommes assurés d'être prêts. Today, through regulatory authorities that were approved with the passage of Bill C-2, we are announcing our decision to temporarily expand the definition of a lockdown so that these wage and rent support programs can support workers and businesses that see capacity restricted by 50% or more. So what exactly does this mean? It means that if you are an employer who has to reduce the capacity of your main business by 50% or more, you will be eligible for wage and rent subsidy support through the local lockdown program. And we are lowering the revenue decline threshold from 40% to 25%. Eligible employers will receive wage and rent subsidy support from between 25% to up to 75%, depending on how much revenue they have lost. Your organization only needs to demonstrate revenue loss during the current month compared with 2019. Employers will be able to apply for these expanded support programs after the end of each program period in exactly the same way that they received wage and rent subsidy support when those programs were launched last year. For workers, our decision means that if you are working in a region where the provincial or territorial government has introduced capacity restrictions of 50% or more, and if you have lost 50% or more of your income as a direct result of those restrictions, you can qualify for the Canada Worker Lockdown Benefit. This benefit will put $300 a week in your pocket to supplement your lost wages. This proposed expanded eligibility will be effective as of last Sunday, December 19th, 2021, and it will run through to February 12th, 2022. Many parts of the country have already introduced circuit breaker public health restrictions in order to curb the rise in cases of COVID. These expanded federal support measures will ensure that provinces and public health authorities across the country can continue to make the right difficult decisions they need to make to save lives, confident in the knowledge that the federal government will be there to financially support workers and businesses as we finish this fight. Notre gouvernement sait que d'autres entreprises sont encore touchées par la pandémie. Depuis hier, les employeurs admissibles peuvent demander une aide financière par le biais du programme de relance pour le tourisme et l'accueil et du programme de relance pour les entreprises les plus durement touchées. Ces programmes offrent des subventions salariales et d'aides au loyer pouvant attendre 75 et 50 respectivement. Lorsque nous avons annoncé ces programmes en octobre, nous estimons qu'ils allaient coûter 7,4 milliards de dollars. La semaine dernière, dans la mise à jour économique et budgétaire, 
nous avons mis de côté un montant de 4,5 milliards de dollars en prévision de l'impact du variant Omicron. Le coût d'élargissement des programmes de soutien est estimé à 4 milliards de dollars et sera entièrement couvert par le montant prévu dans la mise à jour. And finally, let me add that public companies receiving the wage subsidy through these support programs that increase their top executive compensation in 2022 compared to 2019 will have this wage subsidy support clawed back. These companies will also become ineligible if they pay dividends while receiving the wage subsidy. So, as Dr. Tam reminded us last week, all pandemics do end. The emergence and the swift rise of Omicron is not something that any of us welcome. It's coming at a hard time, at a time when many of us, particularly our remarkable healthcare workers, are really, really tired. But I know that we can and we must do what it takes to beat this virus to finish the fight against COVID. Canadians are smart. We are resilient. We support each other. And we have the tools we need, both healthcare tools and financial support measures to win this fight against COVID. With today's expanded federal support programs, Canadians can follow new provincial health restrictions, knowing that the federal government is there, as we have been from the start, to support everyone. Thank you. And let me now pass the mic over to my colleague, Minister Carla Qualtro. Carla, please. Merci, uh, thank you, bonjour, hello everyone. J'aimerais vous parler brièvement de la façon dont nous soutenons les travailleurs canadiens face à cette crise de santé publique qui évolue rapidement. Nous avons constaté récemment une augmentation du nombre de personnes qui ont reçu un résultat positif au test de dépistage de la COVID-19 partout au Canada. Nous constatons une fois de plus que des régions et des provinces imposent des restrictions de capacité et, malheureusement, des fermetures complètes ou partielles. Ma propre province, la Colombie-Britannique, a annoncé des mesures pas plus tard que hier. If we've learned anything from this pandemic, we've learned that COVID-19 is unpredictable and we don't always know what lies ahead. But unfortunately, we know that we could be in a situation again where there would be new regional public health measures to help stop the spread of COVID-19. So when we introduced Bill C-2, which included the Canada Worker Lockdown Benefit, we made sure we built in flexibilities so that we could be agile and make adjustments to support Canadian workers in their time of need. As we've been monitoring the public health situation, we've seen the need to expand the eligibility of the benefits for Canadians whose jobs are impacted by partial lockdowns or reduced capacity orders. That's why today we're making the necessary and temporary adjustments to the benefit to expand the definition of a lockdown order to include workers facing work reductions as a result of capacity restrictions of 50% or higher. Eligible workers could receive $300 per week if they've lost work as a direct result of a public health lockdown order. This Canada Workers Lockdown Benefit is in addition to the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit and the Canada Recovery Caregivers Benefit, both which remain available to Canadian workers. We understand that Canadians may be feeling discouraged by the recent rise in COVID cases and new public health measures, especially at this time of year. And while the situation is evolving rapidly across the country, please be assured we'll continue to support Canadian workers as we've done throughout the pandemic. I'll leave it there and I'll pass it on to my colleague, Minister Duclos. Merci beaucoup, Carla, et bonjour à tous et à toutes. C'est avec grand plaisir que je me joins à vous de façon virtuelle aujourd'hui. Thank you for being here. Today, I want to provide you with a brief, quick update on the health current COVID-19 situation. 
even though we had all hope that this holiday season would look very different than what it does, there are still many reasons to be optimistic. Vaccines for adults and children are widely available, as well as booster doses, thanks to the largest vaccination program in Canadian history. As we end this year, over, over, over 80% of eligible Canadians are indeed fully vaccinated. Du 19 novembre, date à laquelle Santé Canada a homologué le vaccin de Pfizer pour les enfants de 5 à 11 ans, jusqu'au 11 décembre, 32% des enfants de 5 à 11 ans au Canada ont reçu une dose de vaccin, le tout en seulement trois semaines. Voilà des réalisations remarquables. Nous serions dans une situation beaucoup plus difficile au pays si nous n'avions pas des taux de vaccination aussi élevés. Je veux donc et tout d'abord remercier tous ceux et toutes celles qui se sont déjà fait vacciner cette année. Maintenant que les doses de rappel sont disponibles pour le plus grand nombre, je vous encourage toutes et tous à prendre votre troisième rendez-vous si ce n'est pas encore fait. Being fully vaccinated and then getting a booster, whether Pfizer or Moderna, will help provide protection against infection and illness. On this particular point, let me be very, very clear. As soon as you're eligible, whether it is Pfizer or Moderna, you should take the first booster dose available to you. If you have yet to be vaccinated, it is not too late. Every additional vaccinated person helps support our defense against COVID-19, as well as protecting personal health and safety. The government of Canada continues to work closely with provinces and territories and public health partners to accelerate the rollout of booster vaccination campaigns. Close to 5 million Canadians have already received their booster doses. Nous avons également en stock suffisamment de vaccins à ARN messager pour administrer plus de 22 millions de doses de rappel partout au pays. Des millions, des millions d'autres doses seront livrées au cours des prochaines semaines et des prochains mois. Les stocks de doses de rappel sont suffisants pour offrir une dose de rappel à toutes les personnes admissibles au pays, que ce soit des vaccins Pfizer ou Moderna, ils sont tous les deux sûrs et efficaces. Permettez-moi d'insister, dès que vous êtes admissible, qu'il s'agisse de Pfizer ou de Moderna, vous devriez prendre la première dose de rappel disponible. The Government of Canada also continues to work closely with provinces and territories to increase access to rapid testing supplies across Canada. As you may be aware, each province and territory determines its desired approach for testing, screening, and surveillance, as they are responsible for the delivery and administration of healthcare services. We are making sure that our distribution strategy ensures equitable access to rapid tests for Canadians all across the country. As a screening tool, rapid testing provides another layer of protection against COVID-19, along with many other public health measures, such as mask wearing, hand hygiene, physical distancing, proper ventilation, and obviously vaccination. Rapid tests are able to identify individuals who have a high viral load This, despite the test lower sensitivity compared to a molecular PCR test. Des résultats rapides signifient une intervention rapide, mais il est crucial de se rappeler que ces tests ne sont pas parfaits. Si vous obtenez un résultat négatif, continuez d'être prudent en présence d'autres personnes puisque vous pourriez être au premier stade de l'infection et pourriez donc infecter aussi les autres. Si vous obtenez un résultat positif, il est crucial de vous isoler et de suivre les conseils de santé publique de votre localité. Sur la livraison des tests rapides, la majorité des 35 millions de tests rapides commandés par les provinces et les territoires pour le mois de décembre ont déjà été livrés. Les tests restants seront reçus avant la fin du mois et des dizaines de millions de tests additionnels arriveront en janvier et en février. We're also continuing to expand the distribution of rapid tests across Canada. In time for the holidays, we're further working with the Canadian Red Cross that will partner with community organizations, including food banks, to distribute rapid tests to Canadians who use their services. In conclusion, I will urge you to continue to be prudent and responsible this holiday season. Please 
take responsibility for your health and the health of others by following the advice of local public health officials. Restez en, risque, en sécurité et restez prudent. Faites-vous vacciner si vous n'avez pas encore déjà fait et si vous y avez droit, recevez votre dose de rappel. C'est évident et on l'a vécu l'an dernier, les fêtes de fin d'année sont un moment propice à la transmission du virus. Ce sont les gestes que nous poserons individuellement dans les prochains jours qui détermineront notre sort dans les prochaines semaines. Et je cède maintenant la parole à la Dr. Tam et au Dr. New. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. The end of a year is always an opportunity to look back and to look forward. As we look back, 2021 gave us many reasons to hope. Science delivered that hope in the form of vaccines which have undoubtedly saved many lives this year. On the other hand, there is no doubt that the inequitable sharing of those vaccines has cost many lives. 2021 was a year in which we lost 3.5 million people to COVID-19, more deaths than from HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis combined in 2020. And still, COVID-19 continues to claim around 50,000 lives every week. As Omicron becomes the dominant variant in many countries, all of us need to take extra precautions. Today, WHO is issuing updated guidance for health workers recommending the use of either a respirator or a medical mask in addition to other personal protective equipment when entering a room where there is a patient with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Respirators, which includes masks known as N95, FFP2, and others, should especially be worn in care settings where ventilation is known to be poor. However, we are painfully aware that many health workers around the world are unable to access respirators. We therefore ask manufacturers and countries to scale up the production, procurement, and distribution of both respirators and medical masks for use in health and care settings. It's essential that all health workers have all the tools they need to do their jobs the training, the PPE, the safe work environment, and the vaccines. It's frankly difficult to understand how a year since the first vaccines were administered, three in four health workers in Africa remain unvaccinated. While some countries are now rolling out blanket booster programs, only half of WHO's member states have been able to reach the target of vaccinating 40% of their populations by the end of the year because of distortions in global supply. Enough vaccines were administered globally this year that the 40% target could have been reached in every country by September if those vaccines had been distributed equitably through COVAX and AVAT. We are encouraged that supply is improving. Today, COVAX shipped its 800 million vaccine dose. Half of those doses have been shipped in the past three months. Our projections show that supply should be sufficient to vaccinate the entire global adult population and to give boosters to high-risk populations by the first quarter of 2022. However, only later in 2022 will supply be sufficient for extensive use of boosters in all adults. 
So I call once again on countries and manufacturers to prioritize COVAX and AVAT and to work together to support those who are furthest behind. Today, the WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, or SAGE, is issuing a, an interim statement on booster dose. SAGE concluded that the focus of immunization must remain on decreasing deaths and severe disease and express concern that blanket booster programs will exacerbate vaccine inequity. About 20% of all vaccine doses administered every day are currently being given as boosters or additional doses. Blanket booster programs are likely to prolong the pandemic rather than ending it by diverting supply to countries that already have high levels of vaccination coverage, giving the virus more opportunity to spread and mutate. It's important to remember that the vast majority of hospitalizations and deaths are in unvaccinated people, not unboosted people. And we must be very clear that the vaccines we have remain effective against both the Delta and Omicron variants. The global priority must be to support all countries to reach the 40% target as quickly as possible and the 70% target by the middle of this year. No country can boost its way out of the pandemic. And boosters cannot be seen as a ticket to go ahead with the planned celebrations without the need for other precautions. Even as we work to make the best use of vaccines we have, WHO is also working to identify the next generation of vaccines through the Solidarity Trial vaccines. The Solidarity Trial vaccines is co-sponsored by WHO and the Ministries of Health of Colombia, Mali, and Philippines, and aims to accelerate the evaluation of more COVID-19 vaccines to expand the portfolio and improve access. It's also intended to uncover second generation vaccines with greater protection against variants of concern, with longer duration of protection, or to assess vaccines that can be given without needles. The vaccines in the trial were selected by an independent advisory group of leading scientists and experts. Research teams in Colombia, Mali, and Philippines began recruiting volunteers in late September, and so far, over 11,500 people are participating in the trial. So far, the trial includes two vaccines, three others will be included shortly, and more can be included. WHO invites all countries and research centers to participate in this trial. 2021 has been a painful year for many of us, but we cannot allow it to be a wasted year. As we approach a new year, we must all learn the painful lessons this year taught us. 2022 must be the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. But it must also be the beginning of something else. A new era of solidarity. We must leave 2021 behind with sorrow and look forward to 2022 in hope. On that note, I would like to wish all who celebrate it a very Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Christian, back to you. Thank you very much, Director General. Let me now open the floor to questions from the journalists. And again, to remind me, you, although we have a very long list already, if you want to raise your hand, to ask questions. Please 
raise your hand. I can, and when you, I call upon you, please unmute yourself. Um, we'll start with Sophie Mokena from uh, South African Broadcasting. Sophie, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is directed to the officials, Dr. Tedros, uh, Dr. Van Kekhoff, and Dr. Ryan. Uh, I just want to find out with the world commemorating two years next week on the 31st of December since China uh, reported the coronavirus. Where are we as the world in terms of fighting this uh, coronavirus and uh, the variant? Are we beginning to understand the behavior of variants and that are we step ahead or we are still struggling? <laughs> yeah, Sophia, I think, thank you. We didn't get everything when I hope the crying child was not a sign for 2021. Um, maybe we'll start with Mar Dr. Maria van Kerkhoff. Sophie, thanks uh, very much for your really um, very good question, very insightful question. And um, I mean, I think two years into this pandemic, um, we are uh, well trained. Um, we understand um, this invisible pathogen um, that is, you know, causing complete havoc in all of our lives. We have the upper hand in terms of what we need to do to be able to control it. Um, we have tools that can bring it to its knees, um, that can save lives, countless lives. Um, what is unclear to me as we enter into 2022 is how we use those tools to actually end this. Um, I'm very hopeful into the third year of this pandemic that we could actually bring this virus under control. Um, I think it is a formidable enemy, um, but I think we have an entire global army forgive the uh, military um, reference there, but I think we have an entire globe of people who know what they need to do to end this. I think we just really need to come together to do that. Um, we have uh, health workers who are exhausted, um, but who have been tremendous uh, over the last two years and even before that, of course, in terms of keeping people safe and caring for our loved ones. Um, we have a public that knows what they need to do um, and in some respects, you know, they just need to take some difficult decisions to make sure that they limit their exposure to this virus. Um, we have governments that know um, that they need a comprehensive approach uh, to tackle COVID-19. So I'm very hopeful. Um, my concern remains of whether or not we have the stamina to really put in the effort to end it. And I think we can. So um, there's a lot more to do. I, I do believe we're, we're still in the middle of this pandemic, unfortunately, um, but I completely believe that we have the, the power to end it in 2022. So vaccine equity and, and getting the vaccines to those who need them most in all countries must be a priority for every single government, not just some. We need to also be able to use tools to drive transmission down, because if we don't, we will continue to see the virus change and the virus threaten us in ways that will bring us closer to the beginning rather than closer to the end. So I choose uh, to use my energy and the energy of all of the, the, the experts that work with us around the world um, to bring us closer to the end in 2022, and I think all of us can do that. Thank you, Dr. Van Kerkhove, and uh, seeing if maybe Dr. Ryan wants to come into this. Sorry for putting you on the spot in case. Christian, no, I was just listening to, to Maria there. I, 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 um, um, I think we have real hopes of doing better next year, especially when we see governments like that of um, uh, South Africa, Botswana, those and the, the huge transparency that they showed. In dealing with the Omicron variant and and the power of science, surveillance, and public health uh, in Southern Africa has really given us given us real important lead time 
uh, for the rest of the world to prepare for the spread of Omicron. We will see uh, further variants. And what we really need is to have uh, more sustainable strategies that are agile and flexible and adjustable and scalable. Uh, and that we're not lurching from doing nothing to doing full lockdowns. We seem to be in a, a cycle of uh, um, hoping that it's over, you know, putting our hands over our ears and uh, and then going from that sort of ignoring the problem to uh, shutting down society. So I do think and I hope that we have <clears throat> more sustainable, adjustable strategies. And we've seen that in many Asian countries. Many Asian countries haven't fully locked down at any point during this pandemic, if I recall. Singapore at no point has closed its schools, um, kept universities and other things open and made the priorities in society uh, for what society needs to remain open, for example, like schools, and then trading off where uh, uh, physical distance, social, physical, or public health and social measures need to be more intense. So I, I do think we are not at the end of this pandemic. We're not even close. We have the tools, as Maria said, better tools than we've ever had before, thanks to science. We have a much better understanding about how to deal with this virus. Um, but what we've lacked is that collective will across countries and between countries to be really comprehensive and sustainable in the strategies. And I believe that populations and communities have become confused by all of the changing uh, guidance. Um, and uh, we've also had huge issues of trust. Um, notwithstanding everything that Maria said about vaccine inequity, which is probably the most horrific injustice of 2021. I hope and I pray that that can be improved in, in 2022. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. Next question goes to Bayram Altuk from Anadolu News Agency. Bayram, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, uh, Christian, for taking my question. Uh, actually, my question for uh, Mr. Tedros, if I may, please. Uh, Turkey's uh, domestically uh, developed COVID-19 vaccine named uh, Turkovac has been approved uh, for emergency use. Health Minister Farid Nkoja announced a uh, couple hours ago in Turkey today. And he said, as of today, Turkey has become one of the nine countries producing a COVID-19 vaccine in the world. So how does the WHO respond to this, this, to this announcement? And when will WHO approve the Turkovac vaccine produced by Turkey for emergency use. Thank you so much and wish you all the best in 2022. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bayram. Um, I'll hand this question to Dr. Gaspar, Director of Regulation and Pre-Qualification. Rogerio, please. Thank you. Uh, so until now, we had no communication about that and no interaction with any applicant regarding uh, Turkovac. What we can say is that from our side, as we always do, we welcome all the initiatives to develop vaccines that could help during this current uh, public health crisis, provided that a number of standards and requirements are met. So as soon as we have any interaction from the applicant with WHO, we will start to engage and to discuss the conditions that have to meet not only the applicant, but also the regulatory authority of reference, and they are published on WHO website. They are public and transparent. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gaspar. I think that answers that one. Um, next question goes to Jason Bobian from NPR, National Public Radio. Jason, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks a lot for taking my question. I really appreciate it. Um, with with the Omicron variant now out, um, how much concern do you have at the WHO about the effectiveness, particularly of the non-mRNA vaccines uh, against it? There have been some early studies that, that showed very limited effectiveness of some of these vaccines against this variant. How much concern is there, and do you have any more information about how well some of the existing vaccines are, are, are working against this variant? Thank you very much, Jason. This goes to Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, our chief scientist. Thank you, Tariq. I can start. Um, well, this is a question, obviously, that, that we are very interested in, and that SAGE, the uh, Strategic Advisory Group of Experts in Immunization, is keeping a very, very close eye on. As you know, they 
are the committee that advises WHO on um, the policy for vaccines, and they've been making recommendations for each of the vaccines that that we have uh, provided an emergency use listing for. As you know, the Novavax, Covavax vaccine uh, was the tenth vaccine to receive emergency use listing and Sage guidance. These are all widely used, of course, uh, around the world, and um, it is important. Uh, as each new variant has come along, one of the things WHO has done is to track vaccine effectiveness. A lot of data is coming out on Omicron, uh, as it did for Delta. And it is really important to have a holistic view of vaccine performance and not be, um, not have to make decisions based only on early data, which is usually laboratory-based experiments looking at neutralization assays showing almost consistently all of the lab assays have shown a reduction, a uh, significant reduction in neutralization uh, with the Omicron variant, which means that what it's indicating is that the Omicron variant needs much higher levels of antibodies in the blood in order to neutralize it. At the same time, there have been studies that have been looking at the other arm of the immune system, which is a T-cell immunity or the cell-mediated immune response, um, indicating that there is uh, protection that is likely to be retained because the T-cell responses are against a much wider range of uh, antigens on the spike protein, and many of the, those are not have not been mutated in Omicron. So chances are that there is uh, still a good amount of T-cell immunity, which should reassure us that vaccines will still continue to protect against severe disease and hospitalization, which is, of course, what we want vaccines to do. Now, is there going to be a reduction in vaccine effectiveness? Is this going to be different? You mentioned mRNA versus some of the others, like the viral vector vaccines. There are inactivated vaccines being used. And now we have some new uh, subunit protein vaccines, which have still not been um, uh, used very widely. They're just uh, in a few countries so far. So what we propose to do is to really track the clinical data. I think that's really important is we have to go beyond the lab and really look at clinical data. And WHO has also set up um, a technical advisory group to think about the um, potential for changes in the strain composition of vaccines. Uh, we know that a number of manufacturers are already working on Omicron-specific vaccines. Um, it's good to be proactive because we don't know if we're going to need them or not. But in the meantime, WHO's uh, TAG COVAC has been meeting regularly to develop the criteria for when a vaccine strain change may be needed. And if so, what should be that strain? What should be that consensus sequence? Because, you know, even within Omicron, you have a number of different uh, sequences of all of the thousands of sequences being uploaded. So the committee has to select the consensus specific sequence that manufacturers would need to use if there is indeed a need um, to switch vaccines. And that would happen if the current lot of vaccines are not providing enough protection. We, we also today uh, published an interim guidance from SAGE on boosters. And again, there is now data and SAGE has provided a lot of flexibility in heterologous uh, regimens, both for the primary course as well as for the boosting. So uh, countries that have used one particular type of vaccine, let's say a viral vector vaccine, could opt to use um, a different vaccine, an mRNA or a subunit protein vaccine, for example, for a booster dose if they chose to do so. So there is more and more data coming out on, on that as well. But I think this is a time of uh, where the data is evolving, we're learning more and more, it's important that we do not conclude that vaccines are ineffective at this stage. We've said repeatedly, it's very unlikely that a vaccine will become completely ineffective clinically um, because that's not how vaccines usually act. But obviously, we have to be uh, driven by the data and our recommendations will change uh, accordingly based on the emerging evidence. Thank you, Tarek.
Thank you for listening today, and thank you for supporting us with our sponsors. Please go to depictions.media for more information, and click on our contact link and let us know how we can help, how we can help bring your story and help bring us to a better world. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.